Yes, yes. A Rich, Akeem Richens, Bills Fanatics, presents Trendsetters. Once again, I'm your host, A Rich, Akeem Richens, and it's just a, a beautiful, a beautiful time to be a Bills fan, right? It's a beautiful time to be a Bills fan. It's a beautiful time to be a fan of football. And I get to enjoy, we get to enjoy uh, a very good time being Bills fans. Uh, it's just been an excellent roller coaster for the last few months for us as Bills fans, for us as Bills Fanatics fans. And we felt it was time to kind of kick it up a notch. Am I right? We felt it was time to, to elevate a little bit. We have a number of podcasts coming on myself with trendsetters. We have Monster, we have The Shout, we have a lot of excellent podcasts broadcasting a lot of different elements to the Buffalo Bills and to the sports, to the sports culture. But now, we feel it's time to take it to the next step. And I'm going ahead and get right, get right to it. We all know the Buffalo Bills need a quarterback, right? We all know that our team needs a quarterback to be successful. We always trying to hone in on trying to get the franchise quarterback. We've been talking about amongst ourselves, amongst our peers in various chat rooms and various barbershops or wherever you talk about our team, the Buffalo Bills. We all know we need a quarterback. That is the obvious. But what about the rest of the team, right? We go crazy about quarterback. We know we need the franchise, but how important are the rest of the positions? And for me personally, I want to steer away from the quarterback position for a minute. Let's talk about other facets of the game. Because as important as the quarterback position is, we have other positions that we are in dire needs of. And we are in a position where we have a numerous amount of picks and we can fill these gaps that we had besides the quarterback position. Am I right? Now, don't get me wrong. We want our franchise quarterback. We need our franchise quarterback. But let's not ignore the fact. A lot of people may or may not like it, but the fact is the fact. Tyrod Taylor took us to the playoffs. He was the quarterback that was starting for the Buffalo Bills when we made the playoffs. Am I right? Tyrod Taylor was the quarterback. We didn't have too much weapons on offense besides Shady McCoy. Shady McCoy uh, accounted for about 41% of our offense. We got Kelvin Benjamin and tried to enthrust him uh, in the middle of the season, it didn't work out too well. He battled his own injuries. He battled knee, in, uh, knee issues. We had Jordan Matthews who battled injuries and later later uh, went to the injured reserve. I'm not sure how them conflicting reports with Jordan Matthews' knee didn't, didn't raise any eyebrows. The Philadelphia Eagles obviously saw something <laughs> in Jordan Matthews' knee that made him even more of a tradable pay, uh, piece, and he couldn't finish the season. Our best receiver was arguably DT, DeAndre Thompson. Am I right? Uh, Charles Clay is an inconsistent weapon as a tight end. As much as, he, as much as he poses mismatched nightmares, as much as he can block, and he can play receiver, and he... Too big for safeties and too fast for linebackers. Charles Clay is not a consistent weapon or hasn't been a consistent weapon for our Buffalo Bills since he came to our team several years ago. Am I right? Mike Tolbert is Mike Tolbert. <laughs> we know who Mike Tolbert is. A lot of people like to, like to bash Mike Tolbert. Mike Tolbert was put in a position that uh, he couldn't excel in. Mike Tolbert is a fullback. Mike Tolbert and Patrick DeMarco essentially played the same position. I can argue that we didn't need both Mike Tolbert and DeMarco. One of them could have played that fullback role. Am I right? One of them could have played the fullback role. We could have used the cap money from one of the other players to fill the running back position with more of a scat back, with more of a guy with speed. We all want to bash Tobert, but we need to bash the offensive coordinator for putting Mike Tobert in that situation. We knew who Mike Tobert was 
before he came to the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> Am I right? So, bashing Mike Tolbert was, was something shocking. I even got upset with him. But when you take a look in hindsight, he was put in a position to fail. So we had inconsistent play from our tight end. We had uh, bad backups behind Shady McCoy. We had injury-prone receivers with Jordan Matthews. We had injury-prone receivers with Kelvin Benjamin. We all like to talk about how injury-prone Sammy Watkins was, but it looks like karma came for us, am I right? Because all of our receivers, or our big play receivers who were supposed to do something, was injured. And last but not least, we had a below average, and I'm going to say it nicely, <laughs> below average offensive coordinator in Rick, Rick Rico Dennison. So when you add all them things with the tight end inconsistent, the wide receivers inconsistent, don't forget Cordy Glenn, how he was on offense. Cordy Glenn bat been battling that ankle injury for a number of seasons now. He tried to give it a go. He tried to play through it. He ultimately had to go on an ER. Right? So we had inconsistent play from various positions within the offense. And yet, the Buffalo Bills made the playoffs. A lot of people is going to say, well, Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton was the reason. Andy Dalton is the reason. Don't get me wrong. We cannot ignore what Andy Dalton did against the Baltimore Ravens. But when was the last time our Buffalo Bills team had that type of luck? <laughs> our team never gets that lucky. The Buffalo Bills are known for being a bad luck team. So when good luck comes around, it shouldn't be ignored. And that good luck, the old saying is, or my father used to tell me, you're lucky when you're good. So we had some type of success. We had to put in ourselves in some type of position to give Andy Dalton that chance to beat the Baltimore Ravens and to come around and turn the bad luck into good luck. Now, with all them things being said, we all want to criticize Tyrod Taylor, including myself. I still believe we need a franchise quarterback. I still believe we need a guy to take us to that next level. But nevertheless, he was the quarterback that got us to the playoffs. Now, what should we do? We always talking about the position. I seen the Philadelphia Eagles win the Super Bowl with Nick Foles. Nick Foles. Now, a lot of people may turn around and say, well, Nick Foles is a franchise guy. Nick Foles is a very good quarterback. I'm not sure where Nick Foles is as of yet. Am I right? I seen a lot of guys come in, step in and excel because they don't have the necessary game film. These defensive coordinators don't have the necessary game film to match up against these quarterbacks. And I take nothing away from, uh, from Nick Foles, but honestly, I don't see anything different Nick Foles did from Cardell Jones with Ohio State. Am I right? Now, I know Nick Foles was on the bench and he played with the Philadelphia Eagles prior in a prior stint and he played for the L.A. Rams. But it does not ignore the fact that Nick Foles was on the bench. It doesn't ignore the fact that Carson Wentz was looked at as the league's MVP. When you have the league's MVP at the quarterback position, you're not going to pay attention to the backup quarterback. <laughs> Am I right? So Nick Foles, as good as he was, how good can he be for a 1-17 to 17 week season? I seen the Philadelphia Eagles excel with a backup quarterback. I seen the Minnesota Vikings excel with Case Keenum. Case Keenum is not an elite guy. Case Keenum is not an elite quarterback. I seen the St. Louis Rams excel with Jared Goff. Don't get me wrong, Jared Goff is a former number one, number one overall pick, but he, in his second season, has some limitations as well. Am I right? We seen the Jacksonville Jaguars get to the AFC Championship with Blake Bortles at QB. Blake Bortles threw for 3,600 yards, 21 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. He looked bad. He looked porous in that first half against the uh, Buffalo Bills. Missing throws high, missing throws low. Even the commentators had to talk about how bad 
His accuracy was in that game. And yet Blake Bortles was able to win the game, blow out Pittsburgh the next week, and ultimately have the New England Patriots on their heels and, and almost beating them to get to the Super Bowl. Now, when we look at all these teams, the Minnesota Vikings of the world with Case Keenum, the Philadelphia Eagles of the world with Nick Foles, the LA Rams of the world with Jared Goff, the Jacksonville Jaguars of the world with Blake Bortles. What do all of these teams have in common? All of these teams have very good defenses. Am I right? We're talking about defenses that control the game. We're talking about defenses that was fast, physical, and explosive and was able to propel their teams to multiple victories and I don't think it's any different with our team the Buffalo Bills as much as we hone on the quarterback position the fact of the matter is our Buffalo Bills defense was below average if I want to be nice we was below average if I want to be nice we're talking about 26 overall in defense our Buffalo Bills 26 Overall defense, 26 against the pass, as good as Tredavious White was. And we all love Tredavious White. Me, I personally, I think Tredavious White is a very good corner, but I believe he's playing that Josh Norman role. Am I right? I don't know how good Tredavious White would be in a, let's say, Todd Bowles, New York Jets, man cover defense. I don't know how great Tredavious White will be, but I know in this this zone defense, this zone scheme, Tredavious White is our Josh Norman. I know that Micah Hyde had an all-pro season. I know that Jordan Ployer played at an Pro Bowl level and is a Pro Bowl snub. <laughs> to this day, I'm going to say Jordan Ployer is a Pro Bowl snub. Nevertheless, can't forget Leonard Johnson. Leonard Johnson is a guy I believe we definitely need to re-sign. I, I really like this game. I really like this game at the slot corner. We need to uh, get more corners, get more quality corners. Leonard Johnson is definitely one of those quality corners, and he should not be ignored. But nevertheless, the Buffalo Bills against the pass was 26. 26 against the pass, 29th against the run. The Buffalo Bills was 26 against the pass, 29th against the run, and yet we made the playoffs. We made the playoffs with a below average D. We made the playoffs without running back depth. We made the playoffs with our best offensive lineman, arguably, out for the season. We made the playoffs with inconsistent tight end play, and we made the playoffs with inconsistent quarterback play. <laughs> so that goes to show me as much as Rankings do matter. Coaching definitely matters. Sean McDermott, Leslie Frazier, and the rest of that coaching staff did an excellent job preparing us to play week in and week out. And we benefited a lot of games. We benefited from the turnovers. We, f we benefited from being fundamentally sound. And we benefited from excelling in the draft. Am I right? We hit on the draft. We hit... On free agency, we uh, Micah Hyde wasn't supposed to be this be this good. We knew Micah Hyde was was a was a decent player. We knew Micah Hyde was a decent player, but he didn't necessarily wow everybody in Green Bay. He showed his versatility in Green Bay, but he didn't play at an All Pro level in Green Bay. We wasn't expecting Jordan Poyer before Jordan Poyer got signed. Everybody was like, "Who is Jordan Poyer?" <laughs> Who is this guy? We need safeties. We need safety help. We didn't know Jordan Poyer was going to perform to the levels that he performed. We excelled in the draft, drafting Tredavious White, drafting Deion Dawkins, drafting Matt Milano. And, and because of that, that's a big reason we made the playoffs. Under Rex Ryan regime, under Rex Ryan's watch and tutelage, we was horrible in terms of being penalized. We was horrible in terms of being disciplined as an as a offensive and de defensive unit. And Sean McDermott came in. We, we thought we was going to see some of the same struggles in preseason because we had high penalties in preseason. But he came in. He, he 
put his foundation, he stamped his foundation, and we are the exact makeup of our head coach. And that's a fundamentally sound football team. And because we was fundamentally sound, and we hit in free agency, and we hit in the draft, and we caused turnovers at the necessary times, we was able to make the playoffs. But what can we do to take it to the next level? Let's take the quarterback situation out of the equation for a minute. The Buffalo Bills, I, I got to run this stat by you. The Buffalo Bills, in terms of defense, you, know, you want to know where we was one of the league leaders in defense? The Buffalo Bills was second as a team in the NFL in total tackles. Let me run that by you again. The Buffalo Bills was second as a team in total tackles in the NFL. Do you know the top 10 teams that led the league in tackles in the NFL? Let me run it off for you. The New York Giants was the league leaders in tackles as a defensive unit in the NFL. The Giants did not make the playoffs, ladies and gentlemen. The LA Chargers, they, they had an 0-6 skid to start the season. They tried to put it on late enough. Uh, uh, Anthony Lynn and Cole, they couldn't do it. They couldn't put together enough pieces at the right time. They failed to make the playoffs. The Cincinnati Bengals, the Cleveland Browns, the Washington Redskins, the Green Bay Packers, the Seattle Seahawks, the San Francisco 49ers, and the Oakland Raiders, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers round off the top 10 NFL teams that led the league in tackles. We are the only team out of that top 10 that made the playoffs in tackles. So that goes to show me we're on the field way too much. We're not stopping anybody on offense and we're not making enough plays. We're not causing enough turnovers. We're not causing enough three and outs as a defensive unit to be held accountable. When you're leading the league in tackles, it definitely poses a problem. We are 27th. We had 27 total sacks in the NFL last season. 29th in the league in sacks. Pittsburgh led the league in sacks with 56. Pittsburgh Steelers is a playoff team. The Jacksonville Jaguars led the league in sacks with, with second in the league in sacks at 55. They was a playoff team. Carolina was third at 50. They was a playoff team. The Rams was fourth with 48 sacks. The Tennessee Titans was fifth with 43 sacks. The New England Patriots was eighth. The New Orleans uh, Saints was ninth. Overall, out the top 10 teams, seven teams that led the league in sacks made the playoffs out of the top 10 teams. So that goes to show me you have to have a pass rush. Am I right? And that is something that we've desperately lacked. We always want to talk about quarterback position. We always want to kill Tyrod Taylor. I am not going to exclude myself <laughs> from that. I am one as well. But we always want to kill the offense. But what about the defense? Jerry Hughes, Shaq Lawson, team highs and sacks with four apiece is unacceptable unacceptable we need to upgrade our pass rush by whatever means necessary we must find a way in this free agency we must find a way in this NFL draft to better ourselves to upgrade our pass rush we play a 4-3 uh, zone scheme our zone scheme is predicated off one-on-one -on -one play so nine times out of ten we're losing our one-on-one -on -one matchups. Nine times out of ten, we're being blocked by opposing offensive linemen in one-on-one -on -one situations, in one-on-one -on -one matchups, and that is unacceptable. We need to upgrade that pass rush. A lot of people like to talk about the quarterbacks. Let's not ignore what's as important. That's just as important as the quarterback position and that's rushing the passer that's having a quality defense we made the playoffs with a 29th rank rushing defense marcel darius aside
A lot of people was mad at the Marcel Darius trade. We shouldn't have got rid of Marcel Darius. He was a clogger in the middle. The point of the matter is, Marcel Darius was a head case. Marcel Darius got arrested numerous amount of times, and he didn't look like he was uh, ready to take that step and being that hundred million dollar man. He looked like him and Mohammed Wilkinson <laughs> and the Dominican Sue. Then all got their money, got their hundred million dollar contracts. Am I right? Mo Wilkinson, Ndamukong Sue, Marcel Darius, then got their hundred million dollar contracts, and we've seen nothing from these guys after they got paid. So you can miss me with the Marcel Darius. Nevertheless, we have to upgrade that interior defensive line as well. Kyle Williams, we all love Kyle Williams, but the fact of the matter is, Kyle Williams is about to be. 35 years old, if he's not 35 years old already. Adolphus Washington was a mid-round selection, which, which was in his scout, in his scouting resume, Adolphus Washington was a better pass rusher than run stuffer. And in the, his third season, it looked like it showed. Anytime a, a New Orleans Saints team, especially a team, shout out the New Orleans Saints, by the way. Shout out what they did, how they did it. We know New York, uh, the New Orleans Saints for being a predominantly passing team, but they got a rushing game. They got Mark Ingram. They got Alvin Kamara, and they lit us up, both having 100 rushing yards apiece. That is unacceptable when Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram can both rush for 100 yards, and then you have Michael Thomas on the damn outside that can have a hundred yards receiving. That poses a problem. And that goes to show me we have other issues <laughs> besides the quarterback situation. 22 consecutive rushing attempts for the New Orleans Saints is unacceptable. Adolphus Washington needs to take a back seat. We have to upgrade that defensive tackle position. I'm not going to name names on who should be in thrust. In that role, all I'd want is upgrades. Adolphus Washington is a rotational player at best. Am I right? As much as I love Kyle Williams, as much as I love his leadership, as much as I love his intangibles and what he brings with his locker room speeches, at this point of his career, if we do sign him, we have to realize what Kyle Williams is. Kyle Williams is an excellent rotational piece at this point of his career. So Kyle Williams and Adolphus Washington must be in thrust to the back of the depth chart and we must upgrade the defensive tackle positions. Am I right or am I wrong? Get with me. I'm not really going to go crazy and answer too much, answer too much questions. Uh, this is definitely the podcast version. We will definitely get on our live version, our broadcast version later on today. But if you have any questions, you can hit me on my Facebook, you can hit me on my Twitter, and we can definitely indulge in further conversation on the topics I'm talking about today. But we definitely need to upgrade that defensive line position. Jerry Hughes, I'm not sure if Jerry Hughes is the same Jerry Hughes as before. A lot of us like to talk about Shaq Lawson. A lot of us like to talk about how we should trade Shaq Lawson, and Shaq Lawson is a bust. Shaq Lawson is not the guy that we thought he was, and granted, Shaq Lawson is a, a, a pretty good run stuffer. He's pretty good at setting the edge, but we drafted Shaq Lawson to come off and race havoc on opposing quarterbacks, and he has not done so. But nevertheless, Shaq, uh, Shaq Lawson is a cheaper option than Jerry Hughes. A lot of people talk about trading uh, Shaq Lawson. I'm like, hey, Jerry Hughes and Shaq Lawson have the same numbers. <laughs> Jerry Hughes played the entire season. Shaq Lawson played half the season, and yet they have the same number of sacks. <laughs> Why are we talking about trading the, the younger, the less expensive guy in Shaq Lawson? Maybe the guy we need to talk about trading is Jerry Hughes. I don't know. Y'all let me know what y'all think. Again, that defensive front seven, we went in with the linebacking corps, right? We went, in, we went in with the linebacking corps of Zoe Alexander, Ramon Humber. We uh, added Matt Milano, and 
uh, Preston Brown was our middle linebacker, right? That's not going to get it done. Preston Brown is a serviceable linebacker. He's a free agent at the end of the season. Me personally, I would not go out and re-sign a Preston Brown, especially after talks about him talking about he will make the New England Patriots he can help out the New England Patriots and make them a better team and he can help out their defense. You're a, Buff you're a Buffalo Bills guy. Now, I know Chris Hogan and Stephon Gilmore went to the New England Patriots. I know Mike Gillisley went to the New England Patriots, but they did not openly talk about going to the New England Patriots until they found out that the New England Patriots was interested in them first. <laughs> so for Preston Brown to come out, I don't care who he was talking to. I don't care if he was talking to a, a, a Boston reporter, a Massachusetts reporter. He could have chose his words a little bit wiser than how he chose them. And he's talking about how he can make the New England Patriots defense better as long as, as, long as, as well as being a slow linebacker, as, long, as well as being a, a liability on that defense in terms of keeping up with tight ends, in terms of keeping up with tight end, uh, running backs. Preston Brown, I will let test the waters. Am I right? Zoe Alexander, we love Zoe Alexander leadership. We love what Zoe Alexander brings to the table. And Zoe Alexander played a hell of a game against the Jacksonville Jaguars. He looks like in primetime situations, Zoe Alexander is going to come to play. <laughs> I cannot uh, take that away from Zoe Alexander. But when in the course of a 17-week season, Zoe Alexander is simply not quick enough not fast enough, not as explosive enough to keep up with tight ends and other running backs as well. Am I right? Ramon Humber was a special teams player that had to come and play starting linebacker minutes, starting linebacker snaps. And Ramon Humber proved to all of us why he's been a special teams player his whole career. No disrespect, I'm just calling a spade a spade. Our linebacking corps was left something to be desired, and we definitely need to upgrade our linebacking corps with more explosive, more uh, speed, more rangy linebackers in that position. Our front seven needs a total makeover, and we can't ignore that front seven and how poor they played at times on that defense. Now we love our secondary, we love our safeties, we love Tredavious White, we definitely have to pair another guy with Tredavious White. Vontae Davis, I look at as a depth sign. Signing, am I right? You could agree to disagree. Vontae Davis is an older, older player. He's a physical player. He's not as fast as he probably once was, but he's definitely a guy that fits our our schematics. He's definitely a guy that fits what we're trying to do. But I firmly believe Vontae Davis is an upgrade over Sharice Wright and over uh, a Leonard Johnson. Let's put him as a depth guy. If he excels that much in training camp and happens to become our number two corner, fine, so be it. But right now, I don't look at Vontae Davis as nothing but a very important rotational depth guy and I firmly believe we have Jordan Poy locked down for a number of years we have uh, Micah Hyde and Tredavious White locked down for a number of years let's go ahead and and really really lock down our secondary and focus on getting a young rangy athletic corner so we can build our own little Seattle Seahawks foundation. Am I right? Seattle Seahawks have Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas and them guys for a number of years. I think we're one piece of way to building that same kind of mold. So I'm all in on getting that starting cornerback in the draft. I'm all in on drafting a cornerback within the first three rounds of the NFL draft to really solidify that secondary. But as much as we want to talk about the quarterback position, fellas, ladies, gentlemen, gents, let's not ignore the rest of the team. Let's not ignore 
what we obvious, obviously need upgrades on. And that's our defensive ends. That's our D tackles. That's our linebackers. That's our front seven. We definitely should upgrade our front seven if we want to take the next step. We've seen a number of teams last year without elite quarterbacks make impact runs. We've seen the Philadelphia Eagles who had their system in place, who had one of the best defenses. Philadelphia and Jim Schwartz had one of the best defenses in the NFL. Let's not ignore how good that defense was. Let's not ignore how good the Minnesota Vikings defense was. Let's not ignore how good the Jacksonville Jaguars defense was. Now, I'm not saying that Tyrod Taylor is the guy. <laughs> I'm not a Tyrod Taylor fan. I was a Tyrod Taylor fan, but I look at a lot of film and looking over a lot of situations, he's missed a number of receivers. He's either missing or he didn't see them. And that's a that's a telling story even against the Jacksonville Jaguars in the playoff game. Am I right? Tyrod Taylor missed a lot of open targets that was running wide open all day. But we can't ignore the pieces he had around him. Now the Jacksonville Jaguars, Tom Coughlin and Doug Marone is re-signed Blake Bortles to an extension. We know, we know Blake Bortles. Blake Bortles is who we all see that he is. And nevertheless, <laughs> Doug Marone and Tom Coughlin are comfortable giving him an extension and making the play and, and riding with Blake Bortles until the wheels fall off. Why? Because they're going to upgrade that defense even more. The Jacksonville Jaguars, as solid as, solid as a defensive unit they was, they still had some deficiencies as well. You can run the ball on the Jacksonville Jaguars. You probably couldn't pass the ball as much. They had AJ and they had Ramsey. They had a fast, explosive linebacking corpse. You probably couldn't throw on them as much, but you can definitely run on the Jacksonville Jaguars. Let's see what happens when the Jacksonville Jaguars implement a stout running defense. Let's see what happens when they implement guys to stop the run along with the guys they have to stop the pass. That's the, the, the mindset of Doug Marone and Tom Coughlin, and I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it at all, at all, actually. Elite quarterbacks are becoming few and far in between in this NFL today. There's not a lot of Aaron Rodgers left. There's not a lot of Tom Brady's left. There's not a lot of guys left. That's playing on that elite level. So let's not ignore the other positions. Now, I know I've seen a lot of comments. I, I see a lot of people hitting me with the comment. I'm, this is the podcast version again. I might come on later for the live version. But this has been A. Rich, Akeem Richens. I felt it was necessary to talk about our defensive side of the ball in this, in this segment. I felt it was necessary to... Steer off the direction of quarterbacks of quarterback and the need of quarterback right now. It's an obvious need. We all know, all 32 teams in the NFL know that the Buffalo Bills is trying to get a quarterback. But what other things needs to be addressed? Let's not ignore those things. Let's upgrade our team and not just focus on one position. We upgrade our team. And who knows, the skies may be the limit. We have $85 million going into the 2019 season. We have over $100 million going into the 2020 season. So it's definitely something to look after. It's definitely something to watch. Of course, we need our quarterback. <laughs> that is the obvious. But... We have to upgrade other positions as well. Trendsetters, you're listening to A. Rich, Akeem Richens, Bills Fanatics. Until next time, if you don't know me, get to know me.